Hi, uh, thanks very much for having me. So yeah, my name is Daniel Jones. I'm Pearson Music's Education Outreach Manager for the North of England. Um, next half hour, I'll talk about who we are, what we do, how we do it, and for who we do it. And then I'll move on towards the end to talk about futures, and we'll co I'll cover kind of a lot of the same ground as um, Professor Huber here. So. I'm not sure how many of you actually know who we are and what we do, so I'll start off with a general presentation about us and what we do. So forgive me if you know a lot about us, but I imagine there's a lot of people in the room who have no idea who we are, or might have just seen our sticker in the window of a shop and wondered what's, what's that all about. So this first slide sums us up in a nutshell. So we're a royalty and collection distribution society. Our members are songwriters, composers and music publishers. Our customers are basically anybody that uses music. So we had a lot of questions about royalties earlier on and how streaming affects um, artists and hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions. Um, we issue licenses to all music users which allows them to use our members music and the money raised through issuing the licenses are paid as royalties to our members whose music has been used. So as I said that's it in a nutshell and in the next 20 minutes or so I'll go through each one of these points in a lot more detail. First place to start doesn't sound the most interesting place to start, but it's essential you kind of get a background in this before you understand what we do. So it's about copyrights. So every time you write a song, you create a song and put it down in some tangible forms, you record it onto your iPhone, you record it onto a 4-track, you record it to GarageBand or Logic, copyright is created and by default you are the owner. Copyright in the UK is protected by law by the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988. It gives protection to the copyright owner, allows their songs to be considered their property and allows them to be recognised as the copyright owner. This isn't just music, it's anything. Inventors, you invent a new kind of hoover. Again, the same copyright law protects you. So in terms of musical works, as I said, it's automatic as soon as you put it down in some form. It lasts your lifetime, so you write a song today and you can reap the benefits of that copyright for the rest of your life, plus 70 years beyond your death. And you also have full authority to say how your works are used. If you don't want people using your music, you get the right to say yes or no. So what's the actual benefits of being a copyright owner? Essentially this, any time a third party wants to use your copyright, they need to get your permission and they need to pay you royalties. Um, when you join Pearson Music as a writer member or publisher member, you legally assign certain rights to us and we administer them on your behalf. We give licensees access to all our works we have. We've got about 15 million works, so I say works, it's songs. And essentially we grant people permission to use people's songs and we collect money and pay it on to the songwriters. Just to confuse matters a little bit more, every recording of a song has two distinct separate musical copyrights. Personal music deals with the copyright and the underlying composition, so the music and the lyrics. There's a separate copyright in the sound recording, you might hear that called neighbouring rights. Normally whoever pays or provides the facilities for the sound recording owns that copyright. So if you're a songwriter, you'll own a copyright to the composition, the actual song, and if you're signed to a record label, part of their deal they'll sign with you is that they'll own the recording rights. Um, if you're just self-releasing, then you'll own that second copyright as well. And the reason it's important to know the difference between these two copyrights is because there's two companies in the UK who do a very similar job, but basically own the two different copyrights and people always get confused. So I work for a company called Piracy Music who deals with the composition. So we pay songwriters, composers and their publishers. Another company called PPL deals with the performers on the record. So say someone just writes all the songs, but someone sings the songs, we'll just pay the person who writes the songs. PPL, on the other hand, pay the people who perform on the songs. They'll also pay the sound recording owner and the master rights owner or the neighbouring rights owner. So this next slide hopefully sums up um, it a lot better. So I'm sure you all know the song, Kali Minogue Can't Get You Out of My Head. So that song was completely written by PRS members Kathy Dennis, who I'm sure you've heard of, and Rob Davis. So every time Kylie Minogue's song gets played on the radio or on TV, 
we pay Kathy Dennis and Rob Davis because they're the songwriters. They wrote that song. We don't pay Kylie Minogue because she didn't write it. We also pay Kathy's and Rob's publishing companies who are EMI and Universal. PPL, on the other hand, pay the sound recording owners. So they'll pay uh, Kylie's record label, who are Parlophone, and also pay Kylie because she sang on the tracks, so she's the featured artist. Um, depending on the contracts they signed as well when they were recording the track, they'll also pay any musicians who played on the track and also, in certain cir circumstances, the producer as well. So you have these two bodies in the UK who people always get us confused by because we, our names sound very similar and we do uh, very similar things, but we pay completely different people. So we pay the songwriters and their publishers, PPL pay the actual people who perform on the track and the record label. If you get into the world of people self-releasing, self-recording and stuff, we can pay completely the same people. But frequently in a world of pop music, you might think a lot of people write their own songs, but you look kind of behind the scenes and a lot of people have co-writers or a lot of people's songs aren't written by themselves. You look at like Kanye West's new album and you look at who actually wrote the track and there's about 15 different people credited for writing every track. So it gets really complicated. And we basically make sure the people who kind of write the music behind the scenes get rewarded for their songs being popular. So I'll now talk about personal music in a bit more detail. So personal music is actually the brand name of two separate collection societies. There's the Performing Rights Society, who are known as PRS, and the Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, that are known as MCPS. So it's quite a mouthful to say all those words. That's why we've got a brand name, PRS Music. Um, they are two distinctly separate societies, so if people want to join, they need to join both societies separately. They have different rules, different regulations, different memberships. So PRS deals with what's called performing rights. So whenever a song is publicly performed, so it's played at a gig, played in a radio, it's played in a shop, it's streamed online, that generates performing royalties. MCPS deals what's called mechanical rights, which is quite an old term. It basically means when music's copied. So when it's copied onto a CD, a download, or just a birthday card that plays music when you open it, that generates mechanical royalties. Um, this slide kind of sums up the two different companies. PRS is actually 101 years old. MCPS was formed in 1924. Um, they were completely separate companies until 1998 when they formed the MCPS PRS Alliance. It took a decade to realize that that wasn't the catchiest name in the world, so it came PRS and Music in 2008. So PRS is basically run by the PRS board, it's owned by its members and they provide facilities to MCPS. So our members basically own the company, they say how we're run, they dictate our rules, how we distribute money. MCPS on the other hand is run by the MCPS board and is owned by a company called the Music Publishers Association, so they're actually owned by different people. So who are we? We're a brand name for MCPS and PRS. PRS collects performing royalties, MCPS mechanical royalties. We're a member-run organisation, so members sit on our board, say how we're run. So every year we hold AGMs and basically different songwriter and publisher members are elected to our board and dictate our rules. Uh, we're globally connected as well, so there's a version of MCPS and PRS in pretty much every country in the world. We've got uh, what's called reciprocal agreements in over 170 different countries. So we've got Austria, you've got AKM, um, basically everywhere around the world where you think there'll be a collection society, there is one. And we have agreements with them. So say you're a British songwriter and your music's used in Austria, New Zealand, South Korea. The societies in those countries collect money. They pay the money on to us and we pay it on to the British songwriter or whoever the member is. So you don't need to worry about joining a different collection society in every single country in the world. You join one society and you're essentially covered for the world because of our agreements. And PRS is actually a not-for-profit. So the PRS side of the business is a not-for-profit. So all the money we bring in, which is quite substantial, and I'll get to that later, all the money basically goes out to our members. We don't run a profit at the end of the year. We basically hold the money and give it out to all our membership. <coughs> Talk about music using customers now. So if you think about it, most businesses are music users. Um, the BBC is actually our biggest customer and you've got other broadcasters like ITV, Channel 4 and Sky who use hundreds of hours of music every day. Uh, if people like PRS and PPL didn't exist, every time the BBC wanted to use, say, a bit of background music on EastEnders, they'd need to... Uh, 
find out who wrote the song, contact every single songwriter, all their publishers, agree a royalty rate, pay them money onto them, and do the same thing on the recording side of things. So find out every single person who played on the track or sang on the track, contact the record label, agree a royalty rate, and pay it out to them. So it'd be a logistical nightmare. So we give people like the BBC what's called a blanket license, where we say, we basically control all the music in the world with all the um, reciprocal agreements we've got with all the different societies. You can use any of the music you can, you want. All you need to do is pay us X amount and tell us what you use and we'll pay the money on to the songwriters and publishers. Um, you've probably seen our sticker in like hairdressers and bars, they all use music. So, and there's been lots of independent studies that have done that show that customers are happier when there's music playing, uh, they'll spend longer, they'll spend more money. So it's only fair that the people that create that content get rewarded. Um, music festivals, venues, of course they use music, so they're licensed by us. And on the MCPS side of things, record labels are our customers. So every time a record label presses a CD that's got the music of an MCPS member on, we collect a percentage of the pressing and pay it on to the songwriter or publisher. And in the digital age, all the major DSPs, digital service providers that you can think of, like Apple, Spotify, they're all licensed by us, so we collect royalties and pay a percentage on to the songwriters. We license over 350,000 businesses in the UK each year. So who are our members? Basically, songwriters, composers, dance music producers, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. Um, I'm from kind of a rock, punky background, so I offend lots of people by calling everyone songwriters, and I'll speak to the classical community, and I'll say, we're not songwriters, we're composers, and then I'll call someone a composer, and they'll say, I'm a producer, and I'm like, do you write songs? I'm like, yeah, and I was like, that's a songwriter. They'll know I'm a producer. Essentially, no matter what you call yourself, if you write songs, you can be a member of PRS Music. We also have just under 10,000 music publisher members, and we also have what's called successor members as well. So in one of the earlier slides, I talked about copyright lasting in the lifetime plus 70 years beyond your death. So when a member of ours passes away, so sadly someone like David Bowie earlier this year, his works are still going to be copyright for at least the next 70 years. So a successor member will be elected to become a member on his behalf and continue to receive his royalties every time his works are used. So cost in empty pesos or press is a one-off £50 fee per society. It's a one-off fee and that's it for the rest of your life. There's no annual fees or anything like that. Joining as a publisher member is £400 per society. Pretty much every British songwriter you can think of is a member of PRS. Doesn't matter what genre of music you are, you can write dance music, folk, grime. Pretty much, as I said, any British songwriter you can name will be a member of PRS. It's not just British songwriters as well, some of the biggest European, um, North American, Australasian songwriters are members of PRS because we're one of the most efficient and transparent societies in the world. They join us because they'll know they'll get their money quicker and a lot more efficiently. On the publisher side of things, you've got all the majors like Warner's, Sony, Universal, they're all affiliated with the major labels. You've got big independents like Cobalt and BMG. Um, right down to Soul Traders publishing a few of their mates' bands from their bedroom. As long as you meet our criteria to join as a publisher, you can join. Uh, we've actually just um, got over 118,000 members. So we're one of the biggest societies in the entire world. So these are a few different channels people can gain royalties from being a member of PRS and MCPS. Pretty much any gig you play, you can get royalties. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, TV and radio play, your music's used on films, adverts, downloads and streams audio and visual products, the CDs and DVDs, and because of our agreements around the world, all of the above on an international basis. So I'll go through each one of these points in a bit more detail now. So we have a thing called the concert venue scheme. So any time a artist plays a concert venue, so places like 50, uh, 53 Degrees, the Academy or the Apollo in Manchester, Paris Music takes 3% of the box office at every show and pays it on to the songwriters on the bill. If you think about big pop acts playing like the MEN arenas, 10,000 people there paying £100 a ticket, 3% of the box office can be significant. I hear a lot, I speak to a lot of bands and artists who earn more money from PRS than they do from getting uh, their fees from the promoters. Uh, so you can get a, you can earn quite a good living as a songwriter writing for pop stars. So you can write a song for like some One Direction and they'll go touring it around the world and we'll collect money from the venues and pay it on to the actual people who wrote the song, not One Direction. Uh, a lot of people don't know we have a thing called the Gigs and Clubs and uh, Small Venues Schemes. Places that aren't run primarily as music venues, so any kind of pub or hotel um, or little club that has music on occasionally, 
Members could submit their set list to us online and we pay out royalties of about £8 per show. Uh, music festivals are also licensed, all the major festivals you can think of, Glastonbury, V, Reading, Leeds, they're all licensed and we take roughly about 3% of the box office again and pay it across all the set lists on the bill. Radio play, you can also earn quite a lot of money for being on the radio, as this gentleman over there said earlier. So every time you use on Radio 1, we pay just over £13 per minute. It's the same, you can get money from PPL as well. I don't think they publish their figures online like we do. Uh, six Music, you get about £5 per minute. Uh, local BBC Radio Lancashire, just under 37p. This is all done on audience size and potential audience size. You can write a song, it gets on like the A-list of Radio 1. It's played like £20, 20 times a week. It can be hundreds of thousands of pounds just for radio play. You also get a lot of money for being used on television as well. So you use on BBC One Primetime, just under £100 a minute. Because some of our biggest writers are actually people you probably haven't heard of who write music for TV, they write adverts, they write jingles, and as well as their fee they get for writing those songs, they also get every time a song, uh, uh, a song is used on TV or repeated, they get royalties from PRS and PPL. So moving towards the digital age, which I'm sure most of you are interested in, all the major licensees, like I said, you can think of, like Spotify and Apple Music, are licensed by us. So I'll talk a bit more about how money is split, because as a gentleman said earlier, a lot of, you'll hear a lot of songwriters saying they'll get, they'll get their statement from the record label from us, and then you'll see them tweeting, oh my god, I got a billion plays on YouTube and got 5p. And this next slide hopefully sums up where kind of the money goes. So every time you, this is for the paid for services. So when you go to the subscription services like Apple Music and the ten pound a month Spotify uh, Premium, three percent of that, oh, sorry, thirty percent of that ten pounds goes directly to DSP. The record label and master rights only gets about fifty-five to sixty percent, and the songwriter uh, publisher gets between ten to fifteen percent, depending on the deal through PRS Music. So a lot of this model is based on the old recorded media model where a, a record label will have a lot more financial risk putting things out. Um, so say they wanted to press 10,000 of your CDs, distribute them around the world, do the artwork, that would cost them a lot of money. So it's kind of fairer that they got um, a lot of, uh, bigger chunk of kind of the pie. And there's a lot of songwriters at the moment saying it should be more like a 50-50 split. But, um, Personal Music aren't taking a position on that. I'm just going to explain where kind of the money goes at the moment. And this kind of refers a lot to kind of the last presentation. This is basically how we think the global market is going in a digital age. So 2014 was quite an interesting year for Pierce Music. It was the first year where we took more money from digital than we did from physical media. So we took more money from downloads and streams than we did from people buying vinyls and CDs. It was also the first year where we took more money from streaming than we did from downloads. And this basically shows how we think it's going to go over the next few years. So we think basically people aren't, as well as not buying CDs as much, they're not going to be buying downloads as much. But subscription services like Apple Music, uh, Spotify, you might have seen the new SoundCloud pay for service and ad funded things so like YouTube and Spotify free. They're basically going to get more popular, so that's why it's kind of important that songwriters kind of know where their money is coming from and how much they're going to get paid because we think in the future streaming is going to be the future for the next few years at least. Uh, moving back to the MCPS side of things, so every time you sign to a record label that isn't your own and they press a CD, we collect a percentage of the pressing and pay it on to the MCPS members. The same with DVDs, um, computer games, toys and cover mounts on magazines as well. As I said, we've got agreements with, all, with over 100 different countries around the world, so if any of you from overseas you might recognise your um, local society there. This is quite an interesting slide that basically shows where our money came from in 2014. Unfortunately, our AGM is next Thursday, so I'm not allowed to give the 2015 figures out just yet. But quite interesting, as I said, 10% um, of our money from 2014 was from recorded media, so CDs and uh, vinyls. 12% was from online, so online has overtaken uh, physical media in the UK and I imagine 2015 are only going to show a higher increase than that. Quite interestingly, most of our money, 28%, actually comes from international, so from overseas. 
So along with Sweden and America, the UK is one of only three net exporters of music in the world, essentially thanks to the likes of Ed Sheeran, Adele, Sam Smith. UK music is very popular overseas and it brings in a lot of money to the British music industry. 28% of the money we pay out comes from overseas. This is just a very, because I'm struck for time, this is just a very basic process flow that shows how it all works. You've got your peers to music member who joins us. We have your different licensees. They pay us a license fee every month, every quarter, every year. Part of their licensing agreement with us is that they're required to submit lists of every single song they use or give us, the song title, the artist name, and the songwriters, hopefully. Pearson, mem Pearson Music member registers their songs. Our systems automatically match our songs on our database to the submissions we get from our licensees. So as I said, we've got about 15 million songs on our database. We had last year over two trillion lines of data sent to us. So our systems have to be quite sophisticated to automatically match the data against each other. Once our systems match the data, we distribute money four times a year to the PRS members. It's monthly for MCPS members. So I'll just finish talking about a few different future things we're exploring. So you might have heard a lot about blockchain. I can't profess to yeah. be, yeah. I can't profess to be an expert on blockchain, but um, last month we had a PRS Explores um, kind of presentation in our boardroom where we brought in a lot of experts to discuss Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, blockchain kind of technologies power cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Uh, there's a quite a lot of people in startup companies believe it's kind of the future of music. Um, it's a way to efficiently and totally transparency hold copyright ownership data and royalty payments. So a lot of people believe that's the future of paying royalties and holding data in the digital music domain. So we're kind of exploring those possibilities at the moment. Uh, last year we also launched a stream fair campaign which kind of talked a little bit about the question earlier about getting fair pay for songwriters in the streaming age. So that was a lot of campaigning about, you might have heard of safe harbours, safe harbours legislation. Um, I can talk for hours about this. Um, essentially boils down to the certain companies who, because this is videoed, I'm not going to go into details, the certain companies who kind of hide behind kind of safe harbour legislation where there's a bit of copyright in the European law and in America that says, um, if you're a web kind of provider and users upload music or anything to their website, then essentially they're not responsible for the content, so they don't need to pay royalties on. So a lot of kind of big companies, probably you can probably guess who I'm saying, are basically saying that they don't they don't need to pay us royalties or much royalties because this this big bit of safe harbour law says that they don't need to. And then you get people complaining about the likes of Spotify and Apple Music not paying high enough royalties. But I kind of feel it's a little bit unfair on like the Spotify and Apple Music because they're competing against rival services that don't have to pay us royalties or pay us a fraction of what they pay us. So the whole Streamfire campaign is kind of bringing attention to the legislation and kind of trying to get that changed. So everybody's on a legal, uh, on a level playing field. So as soon as a certain ser certain services start paying royalties, then we can expect to get higher royalties from the likes of Spotify. We're also looking at digital fingerprinting technology. So since about 2011, we've been working with a company called Soundmouse on radio fingerprinting. So every time a song is used on the radio, there's a little digital fingerprinting on it that uh, means it's reported to us automatically. So there's no need for people to send us millions of pages of Excel spreadsheets. It's all done digitally. We're exploring that in a little and doing it on digital services and also in clubs and things like that. So we're no longer relying on kind of DJs reporting every single use they, every single track they use in the club. We'll have boxes in say clubs that report every single track that's used so we know what music's used and we can pay the songwriters fairly. And we also last month launched uh, what's called the MAPS Member Anti-Piracy System. Uh, piracy's kind of gone out of public consciousness a lot over the last couple of years but still is very much there. So we launched this at at start of March and We've got about 50 of our, we kind of did a soft launch, we only invited a few of our members to um, trial it to start off with. I think there's about 49 members who've started it and in the, in the two months it's been live, 
Um, we've found over 300,000 um, links to their music up on various pirate sites and kind of notified these sites to take the music down. And I'll just finish on a few big numbers. So I said to process over 2 trillion lines of data in 2015 where we collected over 500 million pounds of royalties so there is a lot of money in the music publishing sector and that pretty much concludes does anybody have any questions quickly because you're on the next panel yes, yes maybe we'll leave Could we save the question because i'm sure people have loads of questions is that okay Beep, 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 beep,